Hey guys, welcome to BP, the Bible Perspective. Let's talk about these two well-known ministers who have exchanged God's truth for man's religion or a lie. Now, before we get into it, please like and share this video and subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. Now, I want to, I'm going to do this in three parts. Talking about these two gentlemen here that I have known over the decades, okay? Uh, Carlton Pearson and Hank Hanegraaff. And while they are as far apart theologically as the East is from the West, okay? What they do share in common is at one point in some of the, the zenith, the, the high point of their ministries, they've made some life altering choices that totally changed the trajectory of the ministry. <clears throat> Carlton Pearson, um, and, and Carlton Pearson, a uh, well-known charismatic Pentecostal preacher, and among other things, okay, uh, back at, I think, ooh, around 2000, came to the revelation that there is no hell, that everybody's going to heaven. Hank Hennegraaff, who is known as the Bible Answer Man, okay, the Bible Answer Man, converted over about five years ago to Eastern Orthodox. Now, I did say this is the Bible Answer Man. So, in both cases, you have these two men who went from, you can say being in the pale of Orthodox. Well, I, I'm gonna kind of correct myself where Hank Hanegraaff is concerned because he would certainly consider himself in the pale of, of uh, Orthodoxy. So that's probably a wrong phrase to apply, especially to Hank Hanegraaff. But they went from being Bible I'm trying to think how to say this without being insulting or anything, or, and I'm trying to be accurate too, that both knowledgeable biblical men exchanged that, in Hank Hanegraaff's case, for man's religion. And in Carlton Pearson's case, he went from, to me, one lie to the other. Now, I'm going to do this in three videos. Initially, I wanted to do it just all one, but I think it's better if I just tackle, take three three videos and, 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 and attack this or address this. I'm not attacking. Okay. <clears throat> but I want to talk about why, because this baffles me. Why would these two men do this? And, and again, I'm stressing the fact that they're both Bible-believing Bible knowing that that's the better term Bible knowing okay um, and, and 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 so why would they make such drastic change uh, I guess that's baffling to me now before I then get into this I want to I want to I'm going to lay the foundation as we talk about these two men um, I'm going to talk about them separately in, vid, in each dress what they have changed over to and I think where they went wrong. But I, I and again, at the end of it, I'm still going to be baffled as to why they did it. But anyway, what I want to talk about is then this idea of man's religion. And in, in this case, really, uh, Carlton Pearson was under man's religion as well as Hank um, because in the, at the end of the day, it is um, these these traditions, these views that are made up by men. Now, certainly Hank would say, no, 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 we're following scriptures, and, and we'll get we'll, we'll dive into that in a little bit in a moment. But when we talk about man's religion, and part of the problem. And um, here, in both cases, part of the problem 
is this this notion that what we are following is God. However, what we are following is God through men. And that's always the case. Every religion, including Christianity, is following men's views, following what men said is God and what God said. Now, as I said, I want to lay the foundation. I want to lay the foundation because um, I think it is extremely important how we got here in the first place. Um, how did we get to this, 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 this thing here where we are, that man is following <coughs> man's religion? But here's the interesting thing. We're following man's religion without realizing we're following man religion. We just kind of assume that we're following man religion. If you go back to Carlton, okay, in his how he was how he grew up, he grew up in the Church of God in Christ. I'm very familiar with that. That is my spiritual roots. Um, and um, and then when you think about Hank. Um, now, Hank is a little different, kind of tracing out his um, spiritual roots, as it were. Um, he um, he grew up, came as, as far back as we can see from a Presbyterian. But regardless of that, what I want to deal with is, again, the, 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 the kind of foundation of this. Now... Like I say, I want to deal with, and I'm going to get into, I'm going to share some scriptures in this video. I'm laying the foundation. I'm going to share some scriptures in this video um, that will um, kind of give you the, where, where I'm going with this. But first, I, we need to understand that world religion <laughs> World religions itself is a part of the world by which, when the Bible tells us, love not the world, nor the things in the world, the, the world itself, the term world, and so is, is man's control, and then, of course, you can also say spiritually through Satan, but it, it is an anti-God. But what the world religions, and a lot of times people, and you hear this term today where people will say, use the term spiritual. I'm spiritual. And the reality is uh, they're fleshly. They're not spiritual at all. They're just uh, fleshly. The idea of following a set of traditions, viewpoints, opinions that were formed by man not by God. Now God tell, has told us, God has told us through scripture how to follow him. Man comes along and, 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 and devise other methods, views, okay? One of the greatest part we see is the Pharisees, the Pharisees were one of the most widely respected religious men of the time. In other words, when, when you when you looked at the Pharisees, you, you would have said, now those are some heavy cats. They know scripture. They know the law of Moses. Now on the other hand, they were also corrupt. And of course the body of the Pharisees, or you could say the Sanhedrin, with this ruling group of men comprised of Pharisees, Sadducees, and different other groups, but the main two groups were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees pretty much ruled. They had the more power, the more, the, they had the more influence. They were also considered the most, the pious of the group. The Sadducees in our today language would be more of the liberal side. 
But to kind of show you, the Pharisees would just make up stuff. So when they would always accuse Jesus of breaking the law of Moses, the reality is that they broke the Pharisees' traditions. See, the traditions, I mean, what they really broke was the, what they said the law said. For example, when they would say Jesus broke the Sabbath day law by when one day um, healing, for example, healing on, on, the, uh, on the Sabbath, it says one Pharisee stood up and said, <coughs> excuse me, stood up and said, there are six days you can be healed. Come on those days and be healed, but not on the Sabbath. But then Jesus, of course, clapped back at him by saying, well, wouldn't you pull your ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath? In other words, in order for the ox to rest on the Sabbath, wouldn't you pull them out? So in order for God's children, a daughter of Abraham, how could she rest on the Sabbath being afflicted with sickness? But it also kind of show you their mentality that they did not have the mind of God, but the mind of men. The ultimate hypocrisy with the Pharisees was, of course, blatantly violating the law themselves and covering up. For example, they hated Jesus. They knew who Jesus was. They knew exactly who he was. They just rebelled against him. And in doing so, broke almost every rule or every command, not every, but they broke the commands that they knew were commands in order to frame an innocent man, meaning Jesus. They bribed, paid Judas 30 pieces of silver. When Judas had an attack of conscience and he came back and he said, we have betrayed innocent blood, their response was, see, that, that's your problem. Judas takes the 30 pieces of silver and throws it on the floor. He goes and hangs himself. Pharisees then, according to the law, say, but we can't use this money. Now, just think about the mindset. Well, we can't use this money. It's the money of blood. So they took the money. They didn't put it into the treasury because that would have been violating the law. But instead, they bought the potter's field in fulfillment of prophecy. Think about the mindset there, how meticulously they were to keep the law there, but okay, framing an innocent man, lying on an innocent man, bribes, all violated the law. So when we talk about again, these incidents here where we have different men that kind of come up with stuff and make up stuff, in each case, this is what we're talking about here. Now, uh, let me be clear so that uh, before we move on, I'm not accusing Hank or Carlton as being a Pharisee. What I am doing is saying how that <clears throat> in the world of religion, man-made religions originate with man. In other words, man makes it up. And then you have people then who follows these man-made ordinances. They follow them blindly. And there's something to be said too about the mass crowds because at some point you are able to, you should be able to discern and say, well, you know, if, if, if God really, did God really say this? But be that as it may. The thing about, <clears throat> excuse me, Hank and Carthen is that they were well-renowned ministers in their theological paradigms. Each are very well-renowned and respected. And of course, they got uh, much backlash when they made their declarations. And as I said, the question is why? The other thing too about the declarations is even in this case, they made such a hard stance saying that it was God in both cases, they said, this is God leading me this way. And then you compile, you concoct an argument. And what is always, without, without exception, and this is across the board, 
whether, whether you deal whether you deal with Calvinism, uh, any Protestant any Protestant religion, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox, um, you know, Baptist, Methodist, uh, and I think Calvinism, all of these man-made uh, uh, of divisions, see, are built upon the views of man. However, when you go to scripture themselves, scriptures themselves, you will find across the board a couple of things that happen. One, they build their theologies on men. Now, the word theology itself means man's study of God, man's study of God. That's what theology is about. Some of it can be good, some of it not so good. So the idea is that it is man's study of God, so therefore it is man's conclusions, findings, opinions, man's traditions that he formed from this. Now, another thing is that people will oftentimes say, a person such as myself, I am not a seminary student. I am not, uh, <laughs> I don't have a degree in seminary. I don't have a degree uh, in theology. So the question is, who am I to dare to be able to disagree with the likes of a Hank Hanegraaff? They don't care about Carlton Pearson because he's charismatic Pentecostals, even though there are people in the ranks would say, who are you to disagree with, you know, Carlton Pearson? Um, but they always say that, and in the sense of, well, who are you? What, what, I mean, well, what do you know about anything for you to disagree with that? And I, I said, okay, let's, I agree. I'm not um, a seminary student. I have not gone to seminary, but you know what? I can read. And every denomination, every religion, Christian, okay, all agree, all, every one of them agree that this is God's word, that the Holy Bible is the word of God, that what God has given us is the scripture. Every one of them agree to that. Every one of them will say um, they believe that is the inspired word of God. So here's where the breakdown comes. We can trace back every tradition, views, theology back to men. That's usually where you will stop. And then it is men who is studying man. I was just in a discussion because in other videos, I'm breaking down uh, the theology of Calvinism. And one of the person wrote me and said, you need to study the Greek and the Hebrew. You need to study this person. And so like I asked him, I said, so you want me to study? You want me to study a man or a group of men who have studied this? But I already have this. So why can't I read this? And there are people that actually believe that you cannot read the Bible and understand the Bible. That you have to go through men in order to understand the Bible. Now, my question would be, does the Bible say that? Does the Bible say any of that in terms of the foundation? Because this is important here. See, this is where you can almost say the battle was, is won or lost because if your group of men, and, and let me just say this. That is true in every single case. The reason why you would never, ever convince a Jehovah Witness that they are wrong is because a Jehovah Witness's sole authority is based upon its leaders going back to Charles Russell. The reason why you're not going to convince a Mormon that they are wrong is because their um, authority <coughs> me, of truth, the authority of truth, goes back to Joseph Smith. Now, we can also say the same thing. You're never convinced a Catholic that they're wrong is because the Pope is the vicar of Christ. Well, same thing here with, uh, like, uh, now in the case of uh, uh, Hank Hanegraaff, the Eastern Orthodox. He has submitted himself under the Eastern Orthodox, which is what? Their group of bishops. They make the call. 
They tell you what scripture means. They tell you how to read scripture. Now, in Carlton's case, he's just kind of out there, you know, um, and basically makes it up as he go. God told me this and God, you know, said this to me. Okay. So, um, the problem is, of course, following or submitting yourself or not submitting yourself to the plain, simple reading of Scripture. So I want to lay the foundation before we tackle uh, these two thoughts here because they're very interesting thoughts. Okay? All right. So what I want to do is, again, I'm going to get into, I'm just going to talk about several Scriptures. And then... Um, We'll come back, I can say, in other videos to talk about um, to talk about um, Hank's conversion to Eastern Orthodox and Carlton Pearson, whatever you know, conversion to whatever it is. He's actually, it's New Thought, is what it is, Universalism, as it is. Um, I'm not even convinced he's a true uh, Universalist, but I, I, I'll come back to that later. Okay, I'll come back to that later. Um, so I want to start in John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. And I'm starting here, I'm going to read from verses 1 through 18. Because again, I, this is a good in the nutshell kind of capturing of things here, a thought. It says, in the beginning, what's the word? Now, right off, we this is important now say this in a moment, but John, who was with Jesus, and he was one of the big three. In other words, pretty much most of the time, John, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him. They saw. Um, <clears throat> but then this revelation also came almost some 60 years after the death of of Jesus as he's writing this now some 60 years after the death of Jesus the, the, in other words the, the Christianity has been in full swing in about 60 years and he's writing this revelation so he says in the beginning was the word now so John like any other gospel what's called the synoptics gospels takes us not only to the physical birth of Jesus, but he takes us back in time through eternity past. So the idea is that if you go back as far as you can go back, back in history, back before the creation of the world, Back before the creation of the universe, space, time, back before any created thing, you go back as far as you possibly can go back, you run into God. Okay? That's what he's saying right here. You run into God. So in the beginning was God. That's the starting point, period. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, another thing to, to we have to look at is, when you go back as far and you run into God, you also run into what you would see, what you would have seen, in running into God, right? In other words, <clears throat> and if you clicked on and you saw this picture of me, okay? I got a t-shirt on, okay? My point is, this is what you're first looking at me, for those of you that, that's viewing this right now. So when we go all the way back in time, we see God, however, what we would have seen is the manifestation of God, and that is the Word, and what John is telling us is who this Word is. Who this Word is. 
So you go back as far back as you can in eternity past. You run into God. But what you would have seen when you had run into God, you know, you would say, oh, this is God. But you would have saw the word. Very important. So in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created. Not one thing, I'm sorry, apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So here's what we know about the word. Because obviously if you know this passage of scripture, you know where John is going with this. And so what this revelation here is, is telling us the word is God not only is God, but the word created all things. Okay, now one thing that was created, that has been created. So apart from him, the word. Now, verse four, here's some other things about the word. Life was in him. Who? The word. Now watch this. Life was in him. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not overcome it. So we know now that the word has life, is life, and that that life is the light of men. Why is John saying all this? Okay, let's let him explain. Verse 6. There was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about the light, who is the life, who is the word. He said he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. Right? This is why John came to testify about the word that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light, the true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This is John's testimony. He was given light. We know that that light is also life. Verse 10, he was in the world and the world was created through him. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So let's stop and unpack this. Because this is important when we talk about, so because we're going to compare this over against man-made religions. And as I told you before, all of the arguments, all of their defense never come back to this 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 verse of scriptures here right that's why as the foundation let's lay the foundation first but they didn't argue about whether or not is uh, trans uh the eucharist and trans uh trans trans um uh, substation i just push it that um but or the presence of christ in the Eucharist, okay? Well, arguing all that kind of stuff. Whether arguing about whether or not it, what is the proper way to join a church, yes. Let's, here's what he said. He came unto his own. Let's go back to verse 10 again. He was in the world, and the world was created through him, yet the world did not recognize him. Then he said he came unto his own, yet his own people did not receive him. That would be the Jewish people. But then look at it. Look at this right, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, he gave right, gave them the right to be the children of God. To those who believed in his name, who were born out of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So we'll get to this born in a, later in a couple of minutes with some other verses. But notice he says, how do I become a child? by believing in his name. All right, look at verse 14. The word. Now John goes back to the word. The word became flesh 
and took up residency among us. Now, this is important because the, the language here that John uses is astounding. Notice he said, by the word became flesh and took up residency among us. We, now this is important, observed. We observed his glory, the glory as of the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So where is the grace? That's important to our discussion. That is the point. What? What? This is also important, especially uh, if you believe in the sacraments. More on that later. The word became flesh. We took up breath of the among us. We observe his glory, the glory as of the one and only Son from the Father. And watch this, full of grace and truth. So where is grace and truth at? It is in the word. It is in the word that took upon flesh. Extremely important because every religion, man-made religion, their grace and truth comes from the body of their leaders. That's the problem. It comes from the body of the leaders who dispense its grace. Come from the body of leaders that tell you this is what the Bible means. This is what the Bible says. All right, verse 15. John testified concerning him and exclaimed, This is the one of whom I said, The one coming after me has surpassed me because he existed before me. Now look at verse 16. Indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness. So far, not one mention of sacraments. The word sacrament means dispensing of grace. If you're a Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and even Lutheran, Presbyterian, some of these Protestant denominations, the idea of sacraments means dispensing of grace. Well, notice he says right here, indeed, we have all received grace after grace from his fullness, not from sacraments, right? Now, how do I receive from his fullness? Let's go back. Look at verse number uh, 11 again. No, verse 12. But to all that did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God. Okay? So, no sacraments. <laughs> Man-made religions tell you that it, your salvation is a process, especially the, um, um, especially uh, the, uh, the Eastern Orthodox that says that your salvation is an ongoing process that you hope to complete. All right, later on, more on, uh, on that later. Verse 17 says, for the law was given through Moses, Get this, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, the one who at the Father's side has revealed him. Now, right here, no mention of Mary. So both Catholic and <laughs> Eastern uh, Orthodox this veneration of Mary. Okay. Jesus is the one who revealed the Father. Go back to verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth. That, that term grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, here's the interesting thing here. Why is John bringing up the, the law of Moses right now? Right? In, in this whole 18 verses, why is he bringing it up right now? The law of Moses represents works. That's why. It represents works, deeds, and that's extremely important. So if you want to expand that through man-made religions, it is man's effort to get to God, man's doing good deeds in order to get to God. That's the problem with that. Okay? So he says the law came through Moses, but notice what he says here grace and truth. 
grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So at this point, well, what is grace? Because of course, this idea how you use grace becomes very important. Grace is the act of God bestowing goodness for no other reason that God chooses to bestow goodness. In other words, he doesn't consider anything you have done, we have done, in order to do us good. That's grace. And this grace is epitomized in the giving of his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? Not sacrament. Because all that term sacraments is just an inflated view of doing good deeds, following man's religion. Um, all right, I want to go to um, John chapter 3. Now, all of this is going to be important for us. All of this is going to be important for us, okay? Um, and I'm going to start reading at verse 14. Many of you know this uh, verse. I'll start reading at 13 because he, he just said this. We just read this in a sense here. Notice what he says in verse 13. No one has descended into heaven except the one who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believed in him will have eternal life. Why am I reading this? Because God is telling us the way of his salvation. Not how men have perverted, not how men have changed and have concocted their view, their traditions of what salvation is. All right. Verse 16. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. All right, let me go to John chapter 5. Okay, so right here, I want you to see this is God's method, message, truth. The truth is in God, grace. This is all of this. This is what God is saying. The failure of religion is not adequately representing this. Chapter 5, and I want to read verse 24. Verse 24, and then he says, I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but has passed from death into life. What is the true gospel? Anyone who hears the word of Jesus. By the way, this is Jesus himself speaking. I know the words are not in red, but if you go back and read the context, Jesus is one speaking here. Anyone who hears my word and notices it and believes. Him who sent me, now notice the term has, not will get, not will work for but has eternal life. But he goes on. And will not come under judgment, but has passed from death into life. This in itself deserves, of course, much more detail because man's problem is not about reform or following a religion, following traditions. Because the condition of man is a life or death condition. And by believing on Jesus, you're passed out of spiritual death into spiritual life. You already have eternal life. You're not trying to get it. All right, let me go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Um... Romans chapter 3. 
I'm going to pick it up with verse 15. Obviously, much more could be said about, oh, I mean, much more we can study on this in detail, the subject of salvation itself. But I wanted to lay this foundation as we talk about each and every, both of the, both gentlemen. Verse 19 says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are subject to the law so that every mouth may be shut and that the whole world may become subject to God's judgment. Okay, so man, the starting point for man is guilt. Okay, guilt. You are guilty. Not only are you guilty, but sentence has already been passed. You're, we're guilty before God and sentence has already passed we're under the judgment of god but how do we get out from under that um verse um, 20 for no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law because the knowledge of sin comes to the law now remember in john 1 remember i asked i said well why is john mentioning moses the law came through Moses, but grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ, right? Now notice what he's saying here. This is Paul writing this, for no one would be justified. The word justified here means to be the, it's the act of being right. A just person is one who is right. Now remember, we all start off guilty. We go back here and we said we all start off guilty. So now how are we made right before God? And this is important because this is where every religion and tradition fails because of the method, the process that they teach how man becomes right before God. That's the failure of religion. Because they have people doing deeds, thinking this is going to make me right before God. So we start off, every man is is is, is subject to God's ju judgment. He is guilty and subject to God's judgment. And then you cannot be made right by doing the law, doing good deeds, doing good works, living right. So uh, keep that in mind. Carlton Pearson comes out of a um, Pentecostal uh, holiness movement, the Church of God in Christ. And even to this day, there are some old school Church of God in Christ that says, if you want to be saved, stop sinning. That, that's the ignorance of the teaching, see? The ignorance of the denomination that still teaches that. They preach and hoop and holler on Sunday, but they don't teach. Definitely this. They're not teaching this. Shame on them. Because a lot of people think, and we'll get to that later, <coughs> a lot of them think, for example, when they backslide because they fail. Well, you failed from the word go by trying to achieve goodness. Now, on Hank's side, uh, the Eastern Orthodox says, hey, join our church. They do some woo, uh, right? And, 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 and they say, now, start your journey of salvation. For no one, verse 20 here, for no one will be made right. And this is the act of being made right. Think about it this way. Uh, if I steal something, if I steal, and um, so now I'm guilty before the law. If I steal, right, I go and uh, I rob a bank, I am guilty. So then you go through the process of arrest, arraignment, court, and then sentencing. But you start off guilty because I've already committed the act. Righteousness is going through that act of making you right. So let's say I go through the act and not for some kind of way, I'm able to be adjudicated as right by the law. In God's eyes, Jesus is the one who makes me right. We'll get to that in a moment. What he is stating, stating to us here, you cannot be made right by doing the good deeds of the law. We also can say you're not made right by doing the good deeds of man-made religion as well. 
verse 21, but now apart from the law, meaning the law of Moses, good deeds, God's righteousness, being made right in God's sight. How do I stand right in God's sight? Remember, I'm guilty before God, but how do I now stand right before God? But now apart from the law, God's, I mean, God's righteousness has been revealed, attested to by the law and the prophets. Verse 22, that is God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. How, I, how am I made right in God's eyes by having faith in Jesus Christ? The failure of every religion has taught that you attempt to be made right in God's eyes by your own effort, works, deeds. And you can never achieve that. Verse 22 again, that is God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there is no distinction. Notice he said, to all who believe, not to all who are part of your church. Hmm. Since there is no distinction for all of sin, and come and fallen short of the glory of God. So regardless of your background, all have sinned and fallen short. But verse 24, they are justified freely by his grace. <clears throat> we already know that the fullness of grace is in Jesus. But he's going to go a step further. Now, why am I picking on this? Why am I highlighting this? Because the sacraments is a perversion teaching of what grace is. That's why. They And by the way, not one single verse of scripture is used to justify that. In other words, you have to come back and go to this scripture and tell us why this doesn't mean this. And they don't teach this, by the way. They teach what men say. They teach a whole, a whole bunch of historic men have taught, but never this. See, that's why in all, in all of their argumentations, whether it's Eastern Orthodox, Catholicism, Calvinism, all the Protestantism, you always go back, you can go back hundreds of years and even a century, a couple of centuries to men, and that's where they stop in men. Let's go back. Where, this is, And they all agree, by the way, that this is scripture. What I'm reading you right now, every single one of them agrees this is the word of God. So why aren't they teaching this? I digress. Verse 23 again, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified or made right freely by his grace. Now, what is this grace then? Remember God's goodness. They are made freely by his grace. And we know that his grace is in Jesus. But what? How is this grace dispensed? They are, they are justified or made righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Notice he didn't say that this. The, that they are made uh, justified by the grace dispensed by the sacraments. <laughs> False teaching. False teaching. And this is what Hank Handegraaff submitted himself to. And, and by the way, Hank knows this verse of scripture. The term redemption means to buy out of. Jesus, by his blood, bought us out of sin, God's guilt. Verse 25, God presented him, meaning Jesus, as propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness, the act of making us right, because, of, because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. Let me go back because, again, very important about propitiation. Um, this word here. I like that it is transliterated because it, it, you know it's something that we can always keep. I think if you're reading the NIV translation, this may come up as atoning sacrifice. And in a sense, I kind of I like this. You know, it, it, it's, it, the meaning is the same. Okay. However, the word propitiation itself not only means atoning sacrifice, but it means the one atoning sacrifice that appeases, that satisfies. In other words, when you use the word propitiation here, what he is talking about, God was satisfied 
in the redemptive act of Jesus. In other words, God is not satisfied in what I do, you do, your works, your deeds. God was satisfied in what Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? His redemption. That is in Christ Jesus. Okay? That's so important. This is where every religion fails at. So he says, verse 26, God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be righteous or right and declare righteous, right, right, through one who has faith in Jesus, not partaking of your stupid sacraments. <laughs> so right here, all of the salvation, right, all of the making of right comes through what? The fact that Jesus is the one. All right, I want to go through one more, and obviously I could go through many. Uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Okay, Colossians chapter 1. Um, so he says, once, this is Paul again writing this, once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. By the way, John 5.24, we're passed from death, that death, sin caused death. See, that is man's problem, that we're in a state of death. Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds because of your evil actions. But now he has, meaning Jesus, reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. Read that again. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him, verse 23, if indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Now, I'm, this verse 23 is going to come, you're going to understand this later when we talk about Carlton, who said everybody's going to heaven. Um, but he said, if indeed you remain grounded, and he, notice he didn't say that everyone is automatically saved. However, the what the work of Christ on the cross is established, and then is what and is received by faith in everyone. Now. That is the foundation, and the reason why I'm reading these verses of Scripture, because as I told you before, um, when we talk about now these two, and I'm going to, in the next video, get into why they believe what they believe. And I'm going to get into <laughs> um, t uh, breaking down each perspective of theology. How they went from one theology, in Carlton's case, to me, he swapped out one lie for the other. Um, the, and then Hank Anagraph, how he goes from, you can say the truth, to man's religion. That he submitted himself to man's religion. And it's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Okay? But it is all built upon man's, see, theology. It's all built upon man's study instead of God's study. And I wanted to lay the foundation here because who am I that I could say I disagree with that? Because as we just read and as we move forward in this, my challenge would be, let's see if what they teach lines up with what we read. That is, there are more scriptures that I, that I could have certainly have shared 
but that is a comprehensive breakdown of God's salvation. And what is sad is how denominations and in the world religions in Christianity do not teach this the way they should. And so it produ the lack of teaching this produce then these kind of men who later we, we wonder why, well, why did they make such drastic changes? Because the foundation, in my opinion, was never there. Now, I can't speak to their heart. And as I told you before, I'm not here to judge these men. I don't know what's in their heart. I can't. If, if I could do that, I'd be a billionaire. I, I'm baffled. In, in both cases, I'm baffled. I understand more Carthens. He, he, he just grew up in a lie. He was a showman from the beginning. And I'll get more into him. Hank I'm more baffled by because, again, he knows the Bible. I shouldn't be concerned because the Pharisees knew the Bible. They knew the Bible as well. And again, I'm going to be clear. I'm not saying Hank and the Grab is a Pharisee. We're talking about the methodology, though. Um, and I will say this, that in, I don't know how he could rectify joining a man-made religion without, without, Those, just show those scriptures we just studied. Just those scriptures we studied. All right, guys, that is the study for now. Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe. Uh, BP, the Bible, uh, subscribe to BP, the Bible Perspective. And as always, I welcome your thoughts, your comments, and your opinions all comments are welcome. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. See you in part two next time.